All right, I am showing noon. Um, it looks like we have 36 folks online. So we're going to go ahead and kick it off. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Amanda Lang. I'm the past president of NAYGN. And uh, before we get going too far, I did want to do a safety take a minute, make sure that you look around your area, identify slip, trip, fall hazards, uh, whether it be small pets, children, et cetera. Uh, make sure you mitigate those risks and know your path of egress in the event of an emergency. I did also want to start with a couple NAYGN announcements. Um, I'll, I'll circle back to these at the very end, uh, but four big takeaways from today. One, our conference registration is open and early bird pricing ends January 31st. I will post this link in the chat, but we will be in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we have an action packed couple of days at the beginning of June. So highly recommend that you check this out. Uh, look at the conference agenda, register now with that, taking advantage of that early bird pricing. If you are seeking um, support from your company, you can utilize this letter to supervisor explaining the benefits of why um, you should attend the conference and any questions you can contact our planning team. So this is the, the newsletter. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll walk through a couple other things here. One, I wanted to draw your attention to the career report survey. So we have about a thousand responses. And so if you haven't yet and you are in the nuclear industry, please take, you know, 15, 20 minutes to complete this. It's really important for data. Uh, we use this to, to go to the leaders of the nuclear industry and say, this is what um, your young employees want um, and this is what's important to them. So it's, it's really important. So please take a second to fill that out. The deadline has been extended to uh, January 19th. And if you are not presenting, I ask that you please go on mute. Thank you. All right. Um, the third thing I wanted to draw attention to, there is another webinar coming up in a couple weeks here on January 24th. It's more on the soft skills preventing and recovering from burnout. So I will include the link to registration in the chat. And finally, I don't have a visual for this, but I did want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that we are in NAYG and election season. So there are 11 board of director positions uh, for North American Young Generation Nuclear. These elections will open January 23rd. So please take a second now, go to NAYGN.org, make sure you are registered. It is free. Um, and that'll just make voting that much easier. And you can also get these cool newsletters. All right. So in just a second, I will post those updates in the chat. At this time, I will stop sharing and I'll let Lindsay start sharing. So I'll give you a second to go ahead and do that. Um, and I will go ahead and introduce Lindsay. So we are really lucky to have an awesome speaker today, Lindsay Keldon. She is from NASA and she is in charge of the fission surface power uh, project. And so basically bringing a nuclear reactor to the moon, which sounds like an absolute dream job, uh, something you'd hear about in <laughs> the movies or um, I, I know I've been watching the show uh, for all of uh, mankind on uh, Apple TV. So anyway, really resonates with me right now. Um, but we're, we're very excited to have Lindsay here to discuss uh, some of those projects. Now, Lindsay, before we get started, do you mind giving like just a super brief kind of intro in terms of how is, te is nuclear technology currently being used in space? So, you know, I'm sure most people have heard of nuclear batteries for like more like probes and unmanned missions. Um, I've heard the, you know, nuclear propulsion a lot. A lot of the programs I read about are more like programs under development. So have we used nuclear propulsion before? You know, what, what kind of is the nuclear technology landscape before we jump into your specific project on where we're going in the future? Oh, and Lindsay, you might be on mute. Okay, now can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. <Yay. laughs> and no great. worries uh, if you want to take a second to just orient yourself. This the slides look great. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah, so right now uh, with, with nuclear and space, what we have out there actively are radioisotope thermal generators. Um, those are part of our radioisotope power system program. And so that would be the, the probes kind of like you mentioned, um, you call them nuclear batteries, but they're, they're small. Um, they are a different type of nuclear power source than what I will be talking about today, which is nuclear fission um, on the moon. But those are just the, the natural radioactive decay of um, alpha emitting particles. So plutonium-238 is very popularly used. Um, right now we're looking at other sources like americium um, to get that that power out of the, the decay. And it's, you know, when you have an alpha emitting particle decay that's about five megalotron volts, you can utilize that to power things. And so um, NASA has used that in the uh, Voyager and also Cassini probes. And if any of you follow space, you know that the, the Voyager probes are still out there um, traveling to the far reaches of our galaxy. And um, they, they, I think, initially were intended to be uh, not as long of missions as they are going today. Uh, I, I can't remember what the original um, was that they were supposed to stop. Uh, I think they they launched in the 70s or the 80s, uh, but they, you know, for example, if it was a 10-year mission, they kept getting extended because that that is a uh, reliable source of power and um, they've just kept them going. And so it's really exciting because they are able to send back some really cool data that we have now. Um, so as far as as the other things like nuclear propulsion and then this uh, nuclear surface power, these are projects that are under development at the current time. Uh, it is not newly under development though. Uh, NASA has been looking at propulsion systems and, and fission systems since uh, even back in the 1960s. Uh, there were projects called the SNAP-10 project and there was projects called NERVA, um, which was a, a nuclear rocket that they tested um, out in the uh, Nevada Outwest. Um, Idaho National Lab had a lot, lot of parts with that and then the Nevada Test Range, I believe, um, housed some of that work as well. But it's not anything new for NASA, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's technologies that they they get going and do a lot of times it's due to fiscal constraints um, we have to go back and readjust um, the priorities for for nasa at the time um, right now it's a, a really exciting time uh, you know we're we're looking at going to the to mars not just going back to the moon but going to mars as well and so nuclear rockets um, using that nuclear propulsion is a, a really great way to um, power power some of these these ships and and so it's 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 back on the the board uh now the the ones that kind of handle the nuclear propulsion work uh nuclear thermal propulsion that's down at marshall space center in huntsville alabama uh the power piece of of nuclear uh is is up at glenn research center in cleveland ohio and so that's where i live and work out of and it's it's just a really a really exciting time uh, for nuclear. You know, we've had the RPS uh, systems out there with Voyager Cassini, but now it's to me, it's 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 kind of like time. Yeah, it's time to bring on the propulsion and the the surface power, and uh, we we've, we've got a lot of support for it right now too. Uh, we are using a different fuel fuel enrichment than has been looked at in the past, and I think that's that's really helped us make some some strides as far as uh, getting a lot of more support from the public too, um, because nuclear tends to have kind of a stigma about it. And so when we go forward and we're saying, you know, these systems that we're working on today, we are having to go back to the drawing board um, because, uh, you know, some people say, well, why don't you just pick up the designs that were left off for, back from the 60s and, and 70s, 80s, so on. And today we are looking at using a lower enriched uranium uh, and so it's it does require you know more of a utilization of a moderator in there, and so we need to go back and do some design change, and so that's kind of where we are today with it. 
Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I really appreciate yeah. that intro. Um, and we're now at 95 people, so I'm just going to clarify one more time. Make sure everybody sure. is on mute. Please stay on mute. If you do have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, and Lindsay, I will keep an eye on the hands raised and any questions that pop up in the chat. But otherwise, um, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to hearing about your, your project of bringing uh, nuclear to the moon and maybe to Mars. Great. So take it away. Thank you. So this project that I'm the project manager for is called Vision Surface Power. And like I said, it's up, uh, it's, it's housed up at NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And if any of you are from Cleveland or ever come out this way, reach out to me. I have my email at the end of this presentation because we do have some of those historic systems that we've looked at in the past at, Clev at Cleveland Glenn, um, and so it's, I, I always love giving a tour to anybody that's interested to see this, this work that we've been doing. I'd like to start off my presentation with a short video. Um, this just kind of sets the stage. It's about two minutes long. I hope the sound comes through okay. Um, if it doesn't, you only have to you know, bear with it for a couple minutes. So one second, I'm gonna try to. Don't no worry. I'll let you know right away if I'm here or not. Space travel is hard. We hear it. And unforgiving. We do not see the video though. It's always oh, really? been. Might be on a different and always screen. will be. Okay. One second then, because you really want to no, see no, the man, no, we can see it. You see yeah, it? Okay. okay. Sorry. My can you apologies. can you still can you still see? We can see the video. Okay, cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Space travel is hard and unforgiving. It's always been and always will be. It's going to be hard. There's a new chance of death going in the little can through deep space. It's a very harsh environment. We think you can come back, but nothing is certain. There are all sorts of challenges we'll face on deep space missions. Communication delays, radiation protection, isolation of the crew. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are. There's never going to be zero risk. When you're breaking the bonds of gravity, that's just part of the deal. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. Okay, all flight controllers, don't go for landing. Retro. Go. I don't go. I go. That challenge is one that we're willing to accept. Go. Man in his quest for knowledge cannot be deterred. Space is not just a destination. It changes you forever. It'll be tough, really tough, but we have the right people for the job. We have pressed the qualities for success into system after system. This country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested. Pushed our people past every failure we can dream of. We have never been more ready to meet the unknown. We will once again explore beyond our world. And we will succeed. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Space uh oh, hopefully it'll let me. <laughs> One second. Okay, can you guys still see that? It says Moon to Mars now. Yep. Okay, great. So what I really like that video because it kind of sets the stage for why are we even looking at putting a power source, let alone nuclear, on the moon right now? And this is all in support of Artemis, uh, which is comparable to the Apollo missions back in the 1960s. Uh, the, those of us today, we are known as the Artemis generation. Whether or not you work at NASA or have any interest in space, we are the Artemis generation. Uh, what what the stuff that we're, we're doing right now is, um, like I said, it's comparable to Apollo, but we are looking at not just the moon, but then on to Mars. And so, 
the moon is actually kind of being considered a more of a test bed right now. Um, we will practice a lot of our Mars exploration work on on the moon before we go to Mars. And so if you go out to NASA's website, uh, you'll see this document here on the left. And this is a roadmap. Um, this is, is publicly available, but it tells the, the story of how NASA plans to get back to the moon and then on to Mars. And some of the things that are going to be needed to have that um, to, to have that be a success. And there are different objectives listed in this document. Uh, those four are listed here, human lunar return, foundational exploration, sustained lunar evolution, and humans to Mars. And the two that I like to highlight are the foundational exploration and human to Mars. Within those two infrastructures, it's interesting to note that the very top priority item needed is a source of power uh, to establish power generation on these surfaces. So it is, it is important. And I liken it to a game that I used to play when I was when I was little, and some of you may have heard of it, uh, some of you may have not, but it's called Sim City, and I know they've made up different uh, different factions off of Sim City, the original one. But I really loved this game uh, growing up. When I first started playing it, though, I hated it because I didn't I didn't understand. You you build like your city, you build your grid and you lay out the roads and, and everything, but nothing happened. And you saw the commercials where these buildings were supposed to grow. And I, I hated the game at first because it was like, nothing was happening. But then I realized you had to actually go and apply the power <laughs> piece to it. And once you did that, then the building started to grow. And it's like, that's when the magic happened and it, everything got exciting and, and came to life. And I liken that to what we're doing here with um, establishing the source of power on the moon, uh, because you know it's you could have everything up there, but it's not until you have that power piece to really get everything to turn on and to where you can start utilizing the stuff that we're we're planning to have up there for a small Artemis base camp um, at first, and eventually the the plan is to have everything um, fully reliable and we now we start bringing in more of that industry to to build a larger lunar grid um, and so we, we but we start off small and I, I say small um, just a small uh, Artemis base camp uh, we believe that a small nuclear reactor could help power that and the size of the reactor we're looking at is about 40 kilowatts electric so not very big um, we certainly won't be the only source of power up there at first. Uh, that we're going to um, be augmenting with um, solar uh, because that is a, an option we can use. And then um, there, and then also there's there's some batteries that are are looking pretty viable as well. But right now, um, nuclear is is really a, a great option for this. And on this slide here, I, I'm going to compare it to to solar and then also wind a little bit. Um, obviously, on the moon, we don't have wind, so that's kind of a non-starter, but we do have the sun. Um, however, lunar nights are really, really long. They're 14 and a half Earth days long. And so you're hoping that your your solar batteries, you know, everything's been powering up well and you won't have any issues to get you through those really long lunar nights. Uh, nuclear power is independent of the sun. It's independent of the wind, and it is uh, it, it is a clean, reliable source of power. And so it's it's something that's uh, being looked at um, seriously by NASA as a way to to have a, a source of power up there. And it can run for a really long time as well, too. Uh, for those of you that are on the call, I'm sure you are aware of the benefits of nuclear. Uh, you could go for a very long time. In fact, I, I have a friend that uh, works with the Navy uh, submarine program, and he said, hey, you know, those subs could go down there and stay down there without ever having to come back up if it wasn't for um, needing to, to feed the sailors on board, <laughs> the crew on board. So um, you, they could probably easily stay down there, he's saying, you know, 10 years or so without really needing to to come up to refuel or, or anything like that. So this is... 
for a place that is so remote as the moon and and even Mars to have a source of power that is reliable like that is is such a such a benefit and so that's why it's being considered uh, now also if we're on the on Mars uh, they've got these this problem with dust if any of you have have followed the Mars rovers you know I think it was opportunity got just caked in that and uh, Mars dust and it just miraculously there was a dust storm that kicked up and um, and and actually not a dust storm but but some like little tornadoes or, or um, things that that came through and kind of wiped the solar panels clean and, uh, and now enabled the rover to, to keep going but uh, this picture in the lower right hand corner on this slide shows Mars on a clear day, and then it also shows Mars when a dust storm comes through. So you can see really how encompassing these storms can be. Um, so we, you know, you, you may not be able to really rely on on this on the sun for during these times. And so again, nuclear is a great option. Uh, and then the upper right hand corner picture that shows um, on the moon where we believe there may be ice, or excuse me, water in the form of ice they are in permanently shadowed craters. And so, again, you don't have this, the solar option in those areas. And so we, we are, are really looking at nuclear to fill that gap or to fill that need. This slide just shows some of our top level requirements that we have right now for fission surface power system. Of, I mentioned 40 kilowatts electric. That is the power level we're we are shooting for. Uh, capable of being transported uh, right now we are looking at you know just do we stay on the the lander um, or are are we going to need to be taken off the lander and moved ar around so we need to stay small enough that that is a feasible option because we are taking off the surface of the earth we need to be relatively lightweight and so our mass is less than six thousand kilograms or six metric tons and you may look at that number and say, man, that's still pretty heavy. Um, it is, but some of the the landers that are being developed right now can actually accommodate up to, I think it's 13 to 15 tons. And so uh, a six, six ton reactor is, is actually pretty good. It's not, not too bad. And if you compare that to commercial reactors of today, uh, you know all the shielding that goes into these reactors and, you know, um, feet, thick of concrete and other materials they can get quite heavy and so this reactor for for what it is uh, it's it's not as much power as a commercial reactor that we have here on earth but it's this is a, a pretty a pretty um good mass to be able to reach uh should, should we be able to get there and so uh, and and also we do have shielding requirements as well uh, that is one of our top requirement is uh, keeping the astronauts safe should they happen to get near it. We're, we want to make sure there is enough distance between a habitat and this reactor. Uh, we're, we're planning to keep them about a kilometer apart. So you've got this reactor sitting quite a bit of distance away from the habitat. Um, there will be shielding on the habitat, just you know, keep out space radiation and, and that. Um, but there may be, maybe we look at, you know, with CONOPS just hey astronauts you know you're on your exploration missions maybe maybe that's something that's looked at is you know just don't maybe there's a cone of of an area around this that they we just advise they don't go to but we do have requirements that are are pretty conservative um just to make sure that they're safe should it should they need to you know should their mission require them to get near it uh, i believe right now we're shooting for five rem per year which is not different than our commercial reactors here on earth um, they have that five rem dose requirement as well and then the life of this is is listed here at 10 years so we're planning to have this up there um, in a kind of a demonstration period for about a year right now um, at first and then should everything go great and be, you know, we didn't see any issues with it, we will just um, turn that over to continue for an additional nine years operation on the surface of the moon. Um, and I will say that I, I say things like we're still looking at it. Um, this project of, of today, FSP uh, 2.0, and you'll 
we, we did look at this um, years ago, and I call that 1.0, but Vision Surface Power 2.0 of today, it is in its uh, pre-formulation phase at NASA, which means we are just looking at concept designs at this point in time. Um, we are very early on in this project, and once we get uh, our requirements nailed down for what makes sense for this reactor and getting feedback in from potential customers, so uh, the, Artemis, um, the Artemis folks need to uh, let us know as well, you know, what, what needs that they have. And so we take all that information and we take information that we've been learning from industry as well, um, companies that build reactors and and um, power conversion systems and stuff. We take all this information and we're going to be um, churning it over the next year or so to nail down what the requirements are for the future vision surface power that will go out on, on the moon. Um, but because we are working a reactor system, we also deal closely with the Department of Energy. Um, and in particular, our any contracts that we, we release for this system are managed by Idaho National Lab. Um, but our, a lot of our nuclear research is done through Los Alamos National Lab. And Los Alamos, if I, I always point this out, if any of you saw Oppenheimer, um, Los Alamos is the one that he did all his work out of for um, the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II. So I always love going out to, I love going out to both labs. Um, the, the country's national labs are pretty amazing places if any of you get a chance to go to them. But I really love Los Alamos um, National Lab, just the history behind it, and uh, we so we do we do work with them. Um, they are doing a lot of the nuclear research for this reactor of ours. Lindsay, uh, real quick, do yeah. you mind pressing that hide button to hide the? Oh, of course, yes. Perfect. And then a couple yeah. quick questions. So I wanted to clarify. So this um, <clears throat> will the reactor be? on well traveling or power like the mission to the moon or is it just once it's on the surface and installed that yeah the reactor yeah. Will be on? yeah so right now the think of it as the reactor will be dormant on its trip to the moon and it's not until it gets placed and it's ready to be turned on on the moon like situated is when we will then um, activate that that neutron source so it's um, it will be kind of asleep. Um, it, it won't be totally without any, like a little bit of auxiliary power just to keep some parts warm, um, just a very small amount. Um, that, and that power will be supplied by the the rocket or the, the lander. It's just, um, it nothing will be active. No fission will occur until it's placed on the moon. Gotcha. Question. And then we had another question from Aria here. So. <clears throat> she said, how big will the market size for energy generation be in space? So that 40 kilowatts, what is that going to be used for? Like, what's the load? Yeah, sure. sure. So we believe 40 kilowatts is enough to power the the first, I guess, Artemis base camp or habitat and it, and and or maybe power up some rovers or land, you know, I, I, or maybe some science, maybe some science stuff. Um, just it's it's not a lot. But then again, we're not the only source of power up there. So if we need to bring a little bit extra and we, we have the solar um, that can help augment. But uh, the goal, ultimate goal, actually, as far as the demand for power, um, we believe that there's going to be quite a bit of that, even into the megawatt um, level. So uh, I mentioned like we, we envision at, at NASA at some point industry is going to come in and and have that that desire to have a larger power grid to um, help power up uh, in situ resource utilization. So mining um, activities on the moon, um, there may be precious metals and stuff that we can get out of the moon. And so those ISRU, those, those in situ resource utilization um, plants are gonna need a lot more power than 40 kilowatts electric. And so gotcha. that's where you're, you're talking more like the megawatt demand and I can tell you that there are quite a few companies that I I know of that are interested in that I, I believe Blue Origin is one um, I think I, I'm not sure on SpaceX's interest I I know of um, different actually other countries that are planning to do this too uh, there, there's quite a bit of, of interest in it I think Astrobotics might be another 
Um, I'm just not just quickly thinking off the top of my head. So there is definitely a demand. what we're picking up a demand. Yeah, there is yes. going to be um, in the future. And these companies are already um, kind of start like they they are looking at what things they could do on the surface of the moon uh, if they had this this source of power and you know they're going to need more than 40 kilowatts definitely uh, but mm -hmm. just the initial out the door we're going to start off small you know just to make sure that this you know vision vision can happen on the moon we want to get that first generation out there and then the plan would be to build on that so maybe we have a block update to maybe we send up then we see you know okay we can we can adjust the power level up this you know to this let's let's look at this as our next generation um, fission surface power system that goes up maybe it's 200 kilowatts maybe it's one megawatt at that time um you know and then there's different things we can even kind of split off from there i will say that uh as far as the the mars aspect of it though too they they are going to be limited more on that weight how you know just what they can get there and landing and so they may actually want a smaller system like this that they can link together if they need more power so they may be interested in a 10 kilowatt reactor and linking like four of them together to get 40 kilowatts or they may be interested in a if they need 200 kilowatts for ISRU on Mars, maybe they would take four of these, or excuse me, five of these 40 kilowatts and link them together. They just have more of a, a weight limit limitation. So that they would be looking probably more at small, a bunch of smaller systems, but then mm -hmm. your stuff going on the lunar grid down the road would be looking at bigger. So there's so many different things that could stem off of this. Lots this of different first system that goes possibilities. Out. Yeah. So yeah. really quick follow on also from Aria, and then I'll let you get back to your presentation. We'll take a couple sure. more questions in a few minutes. But um, what what are the thoughts on nuclear waste? Is it going to, are, are you going to refuel on the moon? Are you shipping waste back? Are you burying it in a crater in the moon? Um, sure. What are you doing with the used fuel? Um, yeah, so that's one of the that's one of the areas that we're looking at right now. Um, when we sent set out this solicitation, um, right now the plan is um, after the ten years, I, I believe, to let it go to shut it down. So we have control drums within this reactor that they're similar to control rods. If any of you are familiar with nuclear reactors, uh, they have like a neutron poison in them. So they would turn in and it shuts the reactor down. And the plan is to leave the reactor on on the surface as of right now. Um, maybe at some point, uh, astronaut crew might bring it back to Earth. I, I'm not sure, but there's there's really not a lot of of uranium in the reactor itself to be of of great concern. Um, certainly not of of it really like leaking out or anything like that, um, or or anything actually like going super critical. You, you know, any, anything like that. There's there's not a concern from that point. But it's it's something that we need to consider and look at. Um, we're we're in a little bit of uncharted territory, <laughs> so to speak. Like what what do we do um, if you start having like maybe other countries want to bring up nuclear reactors too. And right now this single unit, um, not not a, a huge concern to leave this single guy up there, you know, shut it all down and, and let it sit there. I think, in fact, there's probably more uranium in the ground um, in the lunar, <laughs> the lunar dirt around it um, than what would actually be on board this. But uh, now if you do have other countries start putting up systems, then that might be come more of a thing that you know maybe there needs to be an international um standard set or something that you know what what do you do at some point it, it i think it would be become something and, and then if we do go higher power where we need to address that but right now the plan is to to shut it all down and and then let it sit there dormant um right now that doesn't look like there would be a concern for for any any effects off of that but it's something we're still we're still assessing at, the, at this point awesome well thanks right. let's let's keep going with the slide uh, okay we'll, uh, i'll keep track of the the questions in the chat okay yes. <laughs> all right i'm gonna go a little bit faster because i got a few more slides and i think i i've got about 15 more minutes well maybe 
we'll see. Okay, so I mentioned we're very early on in the project and just looking at concept designs for this reactor right now, uh, you can think of fission surface power in two phases. So the first phase, we actually just wrapped up and that was um, reaching to industry and getting their feedback and getting an idea of some initial reactor concepts. And NASA awarded three $5 million contracts to industry last year, or excuse me, the year before in 2022. And those were one year contracts and they wrapped up in September of last year. But the three companies or excuse me, industry partnerships that won those, those initial uh, fission surface power reactor design um, concepts were are listed here. So you had Westinghouse partnered with Aerojet Rocketdyne, Intuitive Machines partnered with X Energy, and Lockheed Martin partnered with BWXT. And it was really, it was really cool to see these two kind of like two opposite uh, ends of the the spectrum come together. So I'll just use Westinghouse and Aerojet as an example. You had a Westinghouse is known for their reactor work, right? Like in Pittsburgh, um, they're very big there and doing a lot of great stuff um, on, on nuclear reactor stuff. But then you have Aerojet Rocketdyne, who's not necessarily specialized in that, but they have the expertise on the space aspect of this because it's a reactor, but it's gonna be in space. And so you have these two different, um, these two different industries kind of coming together. It was really fun to, to watch that. Um, we, did, we, we didn't levy a whole lot of requirements on these uh, companies just because we wanted them to think outside the box and to uh, identify areas that they think work really well for a reactor and areas that might be more of a challenge. And so they each came to, um, to, to us, NASA DOE, with very different concepts. And they all stayed, um, you know, within the, I think the three, we, we leveled, levied three hard requirements on them. One was the safety requirement to make sure that the reactor was shielded enough to um, have no greater than five rem um, coming off of it just for, for safety. Um, the other was for shock and vibe. And I can't re remember quite what the third one was, but it was, the others were all just design goals. Like the um, the 40 kilowatt was was a design goal. The the mass was disable. the size was another one so it has to fit within a, a lander um envelope so i think we were saying four meters wide by six meters tall uh, to be able to do that and so they came to us though with kind of unique concepts um some of them were uh using they all used high assay low enriched uranium that might have been the third requirement i can't i can't exactly remember but they all had that halo in them but they were either um brayton power conversion systems or sterling power conversion systems and either used heat pipes for transferring the heat um from the reactor to the power conversion system or they used um like a gas a gas cold and it was just it was pretty cool to see the different things that came through. Uh, we got all of those design initial designs and also we got some cost estimates from them and schedule estimates in September. And we are taking all that information and we are going to be um, just looking at it, seeing, you know, what is riskier, what's what are the risk items, what are or not so risky and what makes the most sense. So when we go to um, into our next phase, phase two, uh, and we go and reopen this out to all of industry and send out a solicitation for really any company to come in and send a proposal in for that we feel that, you know, from this information we got from phase one, we'll be able to come up with the best set of requirements for that. And I will say that there, if, if you stay in touch with this project, you'll hear the term phase 1A, and that's an extension that we asked these partnerships to do based on some of the riskier areas they identified, we want to better understand those areas. So it was just a little bit of an extension on the phase one that they're they're getting ready to, to do for us as well. So it's, it's just more of that work that we want to be able to assess on the government side. I'm going into our phase two. And then the phase two, um, which we hope to, to get out within the 
the foreseeable future. Um, like I said, it was probably going to take at least a year to take all this information we learned and um, to come up with a good set of requirements. And once we have that, we will release our phase two. Um, we'll release a request for proposals out to industry. And so we'll, I assume these companies up here will bid on them, but then I know of other companies that are interested as well. And so it is, will be a fair and open competition. Um, that is the plan for right, for right now. And the delivery out of that will be the qual unit, or excuse me, not it, like an engineering unit that we have tested robustly, and then the flight unit that can go up on the surface of the moon. Um, looking at having that up by December 2031 was the latest date that I, I heard. Of course, that's pending budgets, and so that maybe that shifts a little to the right, but that's what we're shooting for. So quite a lot of work to do over the next 10 years. <laughs> or so, uh, not even 10 years, for 2031, seven, eight, <laughs> seven years. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it's it's doable and we're, we're ready for the challenge. Um, this slide, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on. This just shows uh, some of the, the fission systems we've worked on in the past at NASA. And I, I started off this presentation talking a little bit about those, uh, even back to the 1960s. I don't show that that work. I just show from 2000s on, um, but it, it is not something new. We have been looking at this for quite a long time. It's just these projects get get going, and then um, they tend to to be a lot costlier than what was originally planned for, and so they have to um, go back, kind of shut shut them down. Let's reassess, and so that's what's happened here. So you see 2000s. Um, this system called Prometheus, and it was a 200 kilowatt electric um, nuclear system up here on the tip. This little green piece of it is where the nuclear uh, reactors, like a nuclear electric um, system. And it uh, it's hard to get the full scale of this, but this whole thing is about the size of a 747. Um, but it was gonna go study Jupiter's icy moons for 20 years, and it ended up being, I think, an estimated $5 billion project. And uh, they got so far as to select a prime contractor for it. Um, and they ended up spending about 400 million, but it got it got shut down. Um, we were told, go back to the drawing board, uh, come up with an affordable fission surface system. And so that's where you got here, 2010, 2015, FSP 1.0. And this was our first uh, try, kind of try at this power level, 40 kilowatts electric. Um, you can see 5,800 kilograms, so right under our, right about our mass weight we're looking at today. However, this this was occurring uh, during the time of the Constellation era, which was NASA took a lot of really big hits during that time frame. Uh, the shuttle program got shut down, and, and a lot of other a lot of other stuff um, rolled up into all that. And so uh, it 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 got so far as a technology demonstration unit was built. This this thing was actually built. And this is one of the systems we have out at Glenn. So if, if any of you do come out um, and and get a chance to go on site, you can take a look at this, this guy here. Uh, we did use a simulator for the nuclear fuel part of it. Um, didn't actually have the fuel in it. Um, just so, something that could simulate that heat. And yeah, we got we got through. Um, Spent about 50 million on it, but a lot of a lot of lessons learned from this guy for what we're doing today. And then we did have uh, a little bit of money. Um, I think about 18 million dollars was spent on this one. This was kilopower or crusty, and you can see the power level now is really small, one kilowatt electric. But this was a system that was it actually um, used a, a highly enriched uranium fuel source, and it was tested out in the Nevada test range back in 2018, and it it was a success and really since it was the first time since the 1960s that we had a a a test that could prove out that this technology is feasible in a space environment so it was a really a really great um great story here with kilopower um, but you can see that the power level is not really going to help us for today uh kilopower was also kind of tied to um helping to see if uh, those RPS systems I mentioned before, that power Voyager and Cassini, the um, plutonium-238 is kind of hard to come by. It doesn't, uh, you can't find it naturally in the ground. 
you have to um, get it out of the like a it's a byproduct out of the fission process and so they have special reactors actually called breeder reactors that are used to help produce plutonium 238 um, but there's a the this came about to see, you know, those are typically in the watts power range. Um, this is about as low as, you, as we had tested for fission, a fission surface, or excuse me, a fission power source, one kilowatt. So we're getting down in that kind of that gray area, like what, you know, if you have a system that needs a lot of watts, you know, do you use an RPS or excuse me, an RTG or do you, maybe use a small fission source like this where you don't have to rely on that plutonium-238 um, fuel. Um, and so it, that's, that's kind of, it served a couple of purposes to help address some of the plutonium-238 shortages. And then also just to be able to test out this fission, fission can, can be a reality in space. And, um, but again, it's, it's one kilowatt electric, not a lot to really power much. And so we're, we are back to looking at 40 kilowatts um, FSP 2.0 of today. And that is this project that I'm talking to you guys about um, right now. And one other key difference, because somebody might say, well, why don't you go reuse this guy in the middle? He was 40 kilowatts and 5,800 kilograms. Well, all of these systems in the past used highly enriched uranium, which is um, considered weapons grade uranium. It's an enrichment of about 90%. And there was a president directive that came out years ago that said, unless you have an absolute need to use highly enriched uranium, you need to use HALU or high assay low enriched uranium, which is an enrichment about 20%. So low enriched uranium, which is used in commercial reactors on earth, um, it's typically three to five percent enriched. Uh, HALU or high assay low enriched uranium is from five to twenty percent. It's actually 19.75 percent, but I think 20 percent. Five to twenty percent enrichment is considered HALU and it it alleviates a lot of the proliferation concerns um, in case you know what if what if highly enriched uranium got in the hands of the wrong person. You know, you, you can build a bomb with that. And so <laughs> using the HALU is a bit of a safer um, safer choice. And so that's that's what, because we have to use that HALU now, you don't get as much energy out of the uranium as you would a highly enriched uranium power source. So as a nuclear engineer, like I love HEU because you get so much more out of energy out of it. But um, I, I understand, you know, the, the desire to go to HALU and it is, feasible still, you know, you can still get um, the, this energy out of it, but you need to have, you need to utilize more of that. The, this is a thermal um, reactor, so we want to take advantage of that thermal neutron. So you, you use more of that moderator in there to get that same amount of energy out. And so it requires you to go back to the drawing board and add, add that stuff in there. And this is just, I really like this because I'm a visual person. And <laughs> to me, like these are, these are just really cool pictures. Uh, just different concepts from the past as well for, for fission systems on the surface of the moon and surface of Mars. And then this slide just shows, uh, I talked about industry giving us different designs, but we didn't want industry to have all the fun on the government side. So NASA worked with the Department of Energy and came up with our own concept of what this could look like. And so we believe, you know, your reactor could sit on this uh, there might be three separate pallets. Your reactor's on one pallet here, and you see these fins that come off of it. And what that is is expelling all this excess heat that's coming off the reactor. So we're sitting about 1200 K, 1200 Kelvin um, is our temperature out of the fission process. And we take that heat and we send it to a power conversion system. And in, right now, there are really only a couple different uh, engines that can take thermal heat like that and convert it to electricity. And those are called either Stirling engines or Brayton, uh, Brayton cycle engines or turbine engines. Lindsay, and sorry, yes, sorry to interrupt. Could you do you mind toggling the slides backward and forward? I think um, yeah. if it gets stuck for some reason, it might be stuck on brief history. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Hey, hang on. I'm going to do no this. Worries. I think people okay. were really excited to see these pretty pictures you really uh, talked about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it flipping now or is it still stuck? Still stuck? Do you want to just okay. maybe stop sharing and reshare? I can stop so share sorry. and then reshare. Yeah. Let me do that. Let me do that. 
Sorry, yeah. to break your stride. No. I'm glad you said something because I didn't want to keep going here. Let's see. Share. This time I'm going to just do text and images because I don't have any more videos. Um, okay. Can you see that new slide now? Yep, we are good to go. Thank you. Okay, so, much. so this, <laughs> sure. So this was the one right after the the history that just showed the different pictures, and then this is our our government reference design. I mentioned um, that we had fun working on it on the NASA side and the with help with the DOE, and uh, we believe that there there might be three pallets. So your reactor is sitting on one, and these giant fins are to take that excess heat, I mentioned 1200K is coming off the reactor, going into a power conversion system, either a Stirling engine or a Brayton engine, but those are only about 20% efficient. And so you have a lot of waste heat. So so really the energy out of these this reactor, if it's only 20% efficient and we need 40 kilowatts electric out of it, you're looking at a 200 kilowatt thermal reactor. And so you have a lot of this heat though, and these radiator panels are used to help expel that heat coming off. And, um, you know, if anybody has an, any thoughts on what we could do with that excess heat going out, just waste, like going out in the atmosphere, let me know, because I think there could be some really cool applications. Uh, there's got to be something we can use all that excess heat for. But anyways, um, you have a controller palette that has electronics on it, and we want to keep them a little bit of a distance from the reactor because there is still radiation coming off the reactor um, and electronics can get affected by that radiation and so we have them setting a, a little bit aside and then you've got your user interface a kilometer away and that's just what that's just showing here and the 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 power from that you know inter user interface would be 120 volts just like you would have um this is what we are envisioning like a 120 volt source uh for the the user to have on the other end but that that's still kind of being determined right now um, as we work with the lunar architecture team and what the Artemis camp would look like. Um, but that's kind of a, a high level view. This this slide just shows Sterling a Sterling work, but we are now looking at what a Brayton system would look like with it instead. But um, yeah, it's just this, it's just been fun to to see overall though. Uh, we, we can say that a 40 kilowatt HALU system is feasible from what we've been able to, to gather. And then this slide just shows some of the investments we are doing at NASA and also Department of Energy. Uh, we are looking at kind of more exotic materials. So for moderators, in the historically you look at beryllium, that's a really good moderator, but we are looking at materials that can withstand this extreme environment of space. And so we're looking at metallic hydrides, which uh, are really good at withstanding this really high temperature. Um, they are corrosion resistant, but you do have a risk of hydrogen diffusing out of it. And so that's something we're working with Department of Energy right now is getting some good samples of um, yttrium hydride, for example, as a moderator and subjecting it, um, putting it through some criticality testing and just, uh, just seeing how much of that hydrogen we do lose. Um, can we encapsulate it with something that keeps the hydrogen in? Things like that. It's really, really kind of cool. Uh, and then also down here, just some of the, that electronics, making sure that they're hardened from radiation, because not only do we have the radiation from the reactor we have to deal with, but we also have the space radiation hitting it too. And so these electronics need to be very um, robust and hardened to, to, to keep the system alive. I mean, it could end up being an electronics issue if, you know, we could have the reactor working great, but if something goes wrong on the electronics side, then we're kind of dead in the water. So we are looking at that. Um, we're trying to put in a lot of um, secondary lines too. So duplicate um, paths or uh, just redundancy. In case we do lose something, we can still keep the reactor up and running. Um, and then this shows like this, there's some Sterling engines down here but just a lot of investment being done right now on these technologies. And then in summary, um, we work with the Department of Energy, their labs. Uh, we are just targeting some of these um, different, different materials because it is a, a little bit different environment than Earth. And we are closely engaged with industry, academia, so universities, um, 
I've noticed there are quite a few universities that are looking at space effects on uh, like nuclear nuclear space effects on materials and stuff. So it's it's a good way that we can partner together um, and then other stakeholders as well. So one thing that I'm working on, uh, trying to make sure this project stays alive when those projects of the past haven't um, due to fiscal constraints is partnering up with the Department of Defense. Um, it turns out that the DOD, the almost every branch of the service is interested in a small fission reactor right now for various reasons. One of them is to um, get rid of that diesel supply chain that they have when they go to, to, to deploy. Um, it can be a target. And so if you can have a different power source that's reliable and clean, um, this might be a really, right, really great way to go about it. And so we are, we, as what, what we're doing on fission surface power is in the same power power class or power level as the DOD. Why not come together on some of the, the like common areas within the reactor itself? And so there's a, a project called Valkyrie that um, helped get started in its, I think it's really gonna take off. It's gonna be a small test reactor or test bed reactor um, housed at Idaho National Lab. And it'll be a partnership with the DOD and Department of Energy as well. So I think between that and you know just coming together on some cost sharing, I, I, I really see FSP being able to survive the next round of <laughs> budget hits should we get them. Um, and we also have a lot of support right now. Uh, there's a lot of work in industry on small modular reactors and advanced reactors that uh, we have some of that commonality with them as well too. And so I think it's just a really exciting time. Uh, for for what we're doing, I did throw this slide in at the very end. Uh, internship opportunities, uh, because I'm talking to a group of young young nuclear enthusiasts, and if any of you are interested in doing an internship with NASA, in particular with fission surface power, we do have three uh, opportunities out there right now. Applications are due by February 16th, and this is open to. I believe it's high school and even through college. And if you go to um, nasa.gov and, or you can just Google internship programs. I don't know if this will work, but I'll click it. Um, if you guys can still see this, you can see what the requirements are. So there is a GPA requirement. Um, this is a STEM internship. Um, so just, you know, high school student, at least 16 years old. And if you, Go to those um, those links that I list here. Uh, where did I go? Oh, geez. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Lindsay, we are having a little bit of trouble seeing the screen again. No worries, though. Okay. I was wondering, can you send the slides to me? I can. And I can distribute to everyone. Perfect. Yes, let me do that. And then um, I stopped sharing because, I, yeah, I. Um, and then also you have my email address too. I would say if you wanna, yes. it's on that final slide with those three internship opportunities. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to send me an email. It might take me a day or two to get to, to them all, um, but I would be happy to answer any questions. And I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but I will turn it over to, to you all um, if anybody has any any additional questions. Yeah, so if you want to raise your hand in the chat um, while we're waiting for the first hand to be raised, we might only have time for one question. You mentioned internships. Are there career positions available as well as NASA hiring? Um, yeah, so if you are interested, go to usajobs.gov, G-O-V, and type in NASA, or it lets you search by agency. So NASA, that is where all of their jobs are posted, is on USA Jobs. And this would be if you are looking for a full-time job, um, they do have temporary jobs and they have permanent positions. And so go on there and you could type, if you type in your engineering, if, if you're an engineer or if you're a financial person or a business person, um, just type in the keywords and you can see what's available. Um, if you are interested in internships, there is a internship program called Pathways that lets you come in as an intern and lets you like transfer into a permanent position after your internship's done and so that's a really cool avenue as well it's not open to high school students i don't think it's just college but um go if you go to 
just Google NASA internships and it shows you the two types, the pathways one, and then also the STEM one. And then, you know, you can apply to these ones that, we, that I've got out there right now for fission surface power. Amazing. All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So I'm gonna pick a question from the chat. So one more just to, to kind of round us out here. Sure. Uh, so Liz was wondering about the HALU, um, you know, what details you have in terms of what assay is available. And then building off that a little bit more, um, you know, I know there's a lot of projects interested in using HALU right now, uh, yeah. small modular reactors, there's a lot of different designs. So are you worried at all about the supply chain? Um, no, yeah. That? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I get asked all the time on that. So HALU, um, for this reactor, we, we're not gonna need more than, uh, I don't think more than a hundred kilograms of this stuff. And in fact, the national labs have said, like, your, your supply for fission surface power is sitting on the shelf. Like, you're not going to have a concern for that, which yeah. is good. Um, there, yeah, HALU is not um, right now commercially available I, in the U.S., but there's a company called Centris, and I think there might be some other ones standing up that is opening a HALU production capability, and that was funded through Department of Energy. They um, delivered their first batch of 20 kilograms at, by the end of last year, and they're planned to do 900 kilograms this year and for the foreseeable future. So I, I think we're going to be sitting pretty good for our HALU supply in the country through companies like Centris and the Department of Energy Initiatives. Awesome. That's good to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, Appreciate everybody for tuning in today um, and you got some really great feedback in the chat. Um, I don't know if you have time to stick around and, and type in responses for the couple of questions we couldn't get to, but um, really appreciate your time, Lindsay. Um, thank you, everyone. I will put one more time the plug in for the couple NAYGM things. Make sure you sign up for a conference to uh, attend other great meetings like other great technical presentations like this. Uh, the career survey extended to January 19th upcoming webinar on preventing burnout, and then elections opening January 23rd. Thanks all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.